Good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to this meeting of the Environmental Protection Commission, our EPC. Um, and we'll start, as always, with a Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag and the invocation led by our Chaplain, Commissioner White. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll ask that you please stand at this time for the pledge, followed by the invocation. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge I allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Heavenly Father, you have uh, given us uh, a responsibility of taking care of this earth while we're here and uh, leaving it a, uh, a better place for future generations to come that will spend their time here. So I pray that you will uh, guide this board and our staff and stakeholders as we uh, make policy decisions this morning that uh, seek to reach that goal. As always, I pray for uh, first responders and members of our armed forces that you will guide them and keep them safe each and every day. I ask for these blessings in your heavenly name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Our meeting is uh, hybrid uh, this morning with a, a quorum of uh, commissioners physically present in the boardroom and others uh, participating virtually along with some of our um, presenters. And so we'll have a roll call at this time for attendance. Smith? Here. Overman? Here. Cohen? Here. Hagen? Here. Camp? Here. Myers? Here. White? Here. You have a quorum, ma'am. Thank you. Um, and Ms. Doherty, have we got any changes to the agenda, any removals from consent agenda? No, Commissioner. Right. Um, and uh, that brings us to, uh, we have no recognitions and proclamations today and public comment, I've been informed we have no uh, members of the public today. That is correct, Commissioner. Okay. Uh, so that takes us to the consent agenda. Move the consent agenda. Second. I've got a motion to approve by Commissioner Cohen, second by Commissioner Myers. Let's take a roll call vote. Smith? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Camp? Yes. Myers? Yes. White? Yes. Overman? Yes. Hagen? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Thank you. And we have some um, uh, interesting presentations today on our regular agenda, starting with the Red Tide update. Ms. Doherty, do you want to introduce that? Thank you, Commissioner. Um, for the next three items, the Red Tide update and the follow-up on the report for the gypsum stacks, as well as the Tampa Bay seagrass update, I'm going to introduce Sam L. Robbie. Um, he is the uh, director of our water division and he will introduce all the presenters. So I'll turn it over to Sam right now. Good morning, commissioners, Sam Alrabi, EPC staff. And this first presentation will be given to you by Chris Pratt. Uh, he will be presenting the status update on red tide following what we have shared with you in the last meeting in August. Chris. Uh, has worked for EPC's water division since 2010, 11 years plus. He started with EPC working in the biology lab. He has collected samples for the monthly water quality monitoring program in the bay segments and in the tributaries. And Chris is currently managing our restoration section. Prior working at EPC, Chris uh, was a DEP state employee, again collecting water samples for the state's uh, water quality monitoring uh, network program. So, Chris. Thank you, Sam. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Chris Pratt. I am EPC staff and I work in the water division. This morning, I'm going to give you a brief update on the red tide conditions in Tampa Bay and spe specifically Hillsborough County. This is a follow up to the presentation given by Tom Ash at the August EPC meeting. I'll start sharing my screen. And if you can see that. We've got it. 
Yes, yes, we can. If you can just full screen it and then move that uh, gray box to just minimize it. One second. How's that look? Perfect. Looks good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Before I start, I'd like to thank our water monitoring field staff and lab staff for all of their work collecting and processing samples over the summer. I would especially like to thank Mike Schumann and Kevin Campbell for ensuring the plankton samples were immediately analyzed and maps were created so we could share our data as quickly as possible. As a quick overview, red tide is a naturally occurring phenomenon caused by an organism named Karenia brevis. It was first scientifically identified in the mid-1800s. It produces toxins that can kill fish and cause eye and respiratory irritation in people when the cells are in the air. Karenia originates offshore, it can move closer to shore or into Tampa Bay by winds and currents. As it gets near to the shore, it can be fueled by nutrients in the water, resulting in red tide blooms. This map shows EPC's water quality monitoring stations in Tampa Bay. There are 52 stations that are sampled on a monthly basis, and many of these stations have been in existence since the early 1970s. EPC has the longest running continuous water quality monitoring network in the United States. The good news is that the red tide conditions in Tampa Bay and Hillsborough County have subsided since earlier this summer. This first slide shows the conditions in mid-July, which was around the height of the red tide conditions in Tampa Bay. The red tots indicate concentrations of Corinia brevis at over 1 million cells per liter, which is an extremely high concentration. These graphics and the ones on the next few slides that are following are courtesy of the FWC. This next slide was the conditions in mid-August, and in particular, the graphic on the right shows how much improved conditions in Tampa Bay. The gray dots indicate areas that were sampled and no Karenia was present. Karenia was still present off the coast of Pinellas County and farther south near Charlotte Harbor. This slide shows the most current conditions as of September 2nd. Karenia is now currently present in Hillsborough County waters in Tampa Bay. Again, the gray dots indicate areas that were sampled and no Karenia was present. Karenia was still present off the coast of Pinellas County, by the beaches, and again farther south near Charlotte Harbor. These next few slides show the corresponding fish kill data as reported by FWC during the same time period I just previously showed. This slide shows fish kills reported in mid-July. In Hillsborough County, we received reports of fish kills in downtown Tampa and along Bayshore Boulevard, around McDill Air Force Base, and in particular, Apollo Beach. You can see the cluster of red dots at Apollo Beach and in the surrounding canals. By mid-August, the fish kills have subsided in Tampa Bay and dead fish were being cleaned up and removed by Hillsborough County staff, volunteers, and local fishermen. Fish kills were concentrated around the Pinellas County beaches and south of Hillsborough County. This slide shows the most current conditions through September 6th. Fish kills are not presently occurring in Tampa Bay or in Hillsborough County and are concentrated offshore Pinellas County and again still to the south of Hillsborough County. This slide focuses on Apollo Beach in particular. Red tide was found in high concentrations beginning in June and has not been found in this area since then. Our sampling shows this Apollo Beach area free of Karenia in both July and August is indicated by the gray dots with our latest sampling on August 31st. In addition, the county has closed the emergency drop-off locations that were installed for residents and volunteers cleaning the canals behind their homes of the dead fish. During the last EPC, EPC meeting, we also reported on two other blooms that were occurring in Tampa Bay that are not related to red tide or Karenia brevis. The first bloom the first is a bloom of Pyridinium bahamense that occurs in Old Tampa Bay on a nearly annual basis. This bloom can have an orange or reddish appearance, but is again not red tide. The primary concerns with this bloom is increased chlorophyll in the water column, which can affect the amount of light reaching seagrass growing in Upper Tampa Bay. There can also be oxygen depletion associated with this bloom, but it does not contain the same toxins that kill fish or cause respiratory problems. The graphic on the right shows the increasing concentrations of pyridinium from May through August. August is typically the peak for this bloom, and we expect these concentrations to start to decrease in September and throughout the rest of the year. There is also a bloom of another plankton species named Prorocentrum micans that is currently occurring in Hillsborough Bay and around McDill Air Force Base. This species can also have an orange or reddish appearance, 
and the primary concern is oxygen depletion in the water column. Again, this is not Karenia brevis and does not have the same toxic effects on sea life or humans. In summary, the red tide conditions in Tampa Bay have vastly improved from just a couple of months ago, with the current concerns primarily offshore of Pinellas County and areas to our south. We remain vigilant in case red tide moves into Tampa Bay again, but at the moment we are fortunate and are not having issues in Hillsborough County waters. We are currently monitoring two algae blooms in Tampa Bay, one in Old Tampa Bay and one in Hillsborough Bay. These are not red tide blooms, and we do not expect to see massive fish kills because of these blooms. I want to thank you for your time, and Tom Ash and I are both available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's, uh, uh, I am struck, as always, by how lucky and fortunate we are to have um, our own EPC with a long history of monitoring red tide in Tampa Bay to have uh, that baseline and that, um, that history of understanding the, the context of, of the data that, that they're looking at on a weekly basis. And, and uh, it's, it's really a, a wonderful asset that we have that report for us here today. Um, I see no uh, questions or comments from the board members. Um, my uh, question is, you know, it's, it, it's, it's comforting and reassuring to see that this um, terrible bout of red tide has uh, dissipated um, and, and uh, back to a normal, relatively normal state, but it was such a, a huge event. What are the lasting um, impacts or, or, and or the short-term and long-term effects of those massive fish kills uh, removing that huge volume of uh, animal life, fish life, plant life from the food chain, from the ecosystem? of Tampa Bay, um, uh, you know, great that Karina Brevis is gone, but what are, what are the short-term impacts and long-term impacts of removing that volume of life? Um, I'll let Tom or Chris answer that, but I did want to let you know when we met with Commissioner, uh, Congresswoman Castor, FWC was there and fishermen were there and they said that actually fishing is very resilient you know, it dies off, but then it comes back. Um, but I don't know the length of time, and we can get you that answer, but um, I'll turn it over to the scientists experts that are online with us. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Tom Ash, EPC staff. Um, based on past blooms and, and seeing how they affect Tampa Bay, um, and concurring with our, our colleagues at the FWC's uh, Fisheries Independent Monitoring Program. Generally, the fishery tends to recover with, in, within uh, three, two to three years, three to four years. Um, it does take a while. Uh, one of the worries about the, the biological load that has been placed on the bay uh, from uh, all the dead fish, as well as the bloom itself, um, when red tide or any algae bloom occurs, eventually it will die off, and um, and all of those cells and all of the all of the matrix that makes up those cells um, fall to the bottom of the bay or wind up suspended in the water column. Um, this is true of all the dead fish. Of the of the millions of fish that were picked up, there are almost certainly thousands and thousands and thousands of them that. Uh, wound up sinking to the bottom. So as they decay, they will um, release nutrients back into the water and they can <clears throat> easily feed another bloom if we're not diligent about um, monitoring and, and being careful with the nutrients that we can control. Thank you. Good answer. And. Um, Thank you very much. Um, seeing no other questions or comments, we can move to our next presentation. Thank you. And Sam, before you introduce the next speaker, I did want to make a quick comment. You know, Commissioner Cohen, you had talked about the flow in the bay and the construction of the bridge. You know, I looked at that slide and I see some of the dots for not red tide, but the other organism. 
if you know this is something this board has done from time to time if a letter from this board is something that you would seek you know you could ask the chairperson if that helps get the f dot to fund the the water flowing under the i think bridge. that's an excellent suggestion i'll be happy to make that motion for the chair to to uh pen a letter and and send it to f dot making that request okay thank you and you can work with me on on drafting that absolutely thank you very much you're welcome uh so we I'll have a motion, motion. I'll do a second. and a, a second uh from commissioner kemp and commissioner overman to for the chair to draft that letter let's uh seeing no other comment let's take a roll call vote smith yes cohen yes kemp yes myers yes white yes overman yes hagan yes motion carried seven to zero thank you and before we leave the red tide um, uh, topic commissioner kemp had uh, her hand raised i missed it no, you didn't miss it. I was just a little late. Okay. <laughs> but um, I just wondered, I, I was at Reddington Madeira Beach, and I saw it on the, the map there. It's kind of the land is, uh, that's the place where the land is out into the water. Um, and the red tide there was pretty awful this weekend. Nobody would be out there. It wasn't uh, breathable. So I was actually relieved to see the presentation because it, looked like it was a little bit better than I would have imagined um, in, 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 from the experience of that. But I'm just wondering about, in particular, because that is jutted kind of out, is that, does that get more affected there? And now that it's dissipated a lot of places because of the seasonal, seasonality of it, um, do we expect that th this is, it, it kind of will, be this is playing itself out from Piney Point or uh, Tom or Chris uh, yes commissioners Tom Ash again it it all depends on the weather and the wind um, as always um, and the weather in a couple of different ways not just uh, rainfall and the wind direction which helps move the boom offshore but also whether we get some cold snaps uh, Karenia does not like cooler water um, it tends to thrive in warmer water. The bloom that started uh, back in, actually the bloom in 2018 started in the winter of 2017. And one of the reasons it stayed persistent throughout the winter is it stayed very warm that year. And the water never really dipped below the threshold that Karenia is not comfortable with. So um, unfortunately, we're, we're kind of at the whim of of the weather and those conditions. Um, if I may, just something germane back to the, the bridge discussion. The, um, there is a meeting happening as we speak and there's a presentation, it's with the Agency on Bay Management, and there's a presentation on the proposed new Gandhi Bridge. And so um, I think it's timely, very timely to be asking those questions and sending letters because we have perhaps an opportunity to get in on the ground floor during the planning process for the Gandhi Bridge. It may be too late for the Howard Franklin, but I think maybe we can get in early on the Gandhi. Thank you. Thank you, great, um, great point. Um, and with that, we can move to the next presentation, Ms. Doherty. Thank you. The, we're gonna move to the follow-up report on uh, gypsum stacks. I'll let Sam introduce the next speaker, but um, we're just gonna clarify some questions that were asked um, for members of the public and, and have some transparency and talk about the clay settling areas and the lined ponds. So with that, Sam, could you introduce the speaker? Good morning, Commissioner Sam and Robbie again, EPC staff. Uh, like Janet mentioned, we're bringing you this follow-up uh, presentation to provide some clarifications and answer some questions that were raised in our last commission uh, meeting in August. And the questions pertain to which gypsum stacks in Hillsborough County are lined or unlined. We'll make that pretty clear. Even pictorially, you could see it. Also, the issue of clay material coming into Hillsborough County from outside uh, the county and the nature of that water that comes in with the clays. 
Those two items will be uh, presented to you by Ed Kopik. The last item on, uh, as a follow-up would be the radiation impacts from gypsum stacks. And that will be addressed by uh, Reggie Sanford of uh, EPC. But first, I'll introduce Ed Kopik to address the first two questions on fossil gypsum line on line and the clay importation. Uh, Ed is a professional engineer with 30 years of engineering experience. He worked seven years at the state FDEP, then two years as a private wastewater uh, consultant before joining EPC 21 years ago as a professional engineer in the water division. Uh, Ed is the primary engineer at EPC responsible for uh, inspections of gypsum stacks in the county and the clay settling areas up the mines here in Hillsborough County. With that, uh, Ed. Okay. I will be sharing my screen now. Can, every, can everyone see that? Yes. Yes, we can. If you could just make it full screen, please. Yep, just that, that little button right down on the bottom of the right. Keep going down. Yes. Someone, yep, slide Okay, there we go. Okay, good, good morning, commissioners. My name is Ed Kopik. I'm with the Water Division. This item is a continuation of our discussion of Fosco gypsum stacks in Hillsborough County. We wanted to answer some questions that commissioners had and clarify some other issues. First, I'm going to revisit the differences between the gypsum stacks at the chemical processing plants, specifically which stacks are lined and which are unlined on the bottom. Next, I'll provide a presentation on the operations at the mines to separate phosphate rock from the clay and sand. Finally, after my presentation, information on radiation, radon, and gypsum will be given. There are two chemical processing plants in our county, one which produces fertilizer and one which has permanently ceased operation. The Plant City facility is located in the northeastern portion of the county at the Pasco County border. The Riverview facility is located west of US 41 at the mouth of the Alify River on Hillsborough Bay. You may remember the process to produce fertilizer is performed at the chemical processing plant by reacting phosphate rock transported from the mines which with sulfur Buric acid to produce phosphoric acid, which along with ammonia is used to create the fertilizer product, primarily diammonium phosphate or DAP. Phosphogypsum, or gypsum as it is called, is a byproduct of this process. Approximately one ton of gypsum is generated for every five tons of fertilizer produced. The gypsum must be stored in stacks because it, because it is mildly radioactive. This is an aerial of the Riverview facility looking east. The line stacks and cooling ponds are circled in green. The clay line stack is circled in yellow and the end line stack is circled in red. The chemical facility is located to the south in the active stack area consisting of the north gypsum stack and the gypsum stack expansion is in the distance across US 41. The grassed gypsum stack in the foreground on Hillsborough Bay is the old gypsum stack, which has its origins as a gypsum disposal field in the 1920s and 30s when the fertilizer production first began. The stack was closed in 1988. The top of the stack is lined with HDPE and is operating as an auxiliary holding pond for processed wastewater. This old stack is unlined on the bottom as it was not required by state or federal regulations at the time it was started. The stack was engineered and does not include, it does include side and toe seepage collection drains. The side slopes have been closed with a non-gypsum cover material and vegetation planted. As was discussed at the last meeting, groundwater is protected by an underground cutoff wall 
that is keyed into the confining layer. The cutoff wall is designed to prevent lateral migration of leachate beyond the toe drains. This cutoff wall with confining layer basically creates a bathtub effect to contain the groundwater for removal by the drains. This is an aerial of the active stack area looking south. The stack circled in yellow is the north gypsum stack. It was constructed in two phases, the second of which was completed in 1990. It is lined on the bottom with clay in a compactive protective soil cover in accordance with state regulations at the time. The stack circled in green is the gypsum stack expansion area. It is lined on the bottom with HDEPE plastic. The southernmost water you see is a cooling pond, and it is also lined on the top with HDPE. The entire active stack area, both the north gypsum stack and the expan expansion area, is protected by an underground cutoff wall that operates similarly to the one for the closed stack described previously. This is an aerial looking straight down on all the gypsum stacks. The old closed stack circled in red is on the left and the active stack circled in yellow and green are on the right. Moving to the next facility, this is an aerial of the Mosaic Plant City facility looking north. As was mentioned at the last meeting, the fer fertilizer manufacturing plant was constructed in the early 1960s. Operation was temporarily idled in December 2017 and since June 2019, the phosphate fertilizer plant shown on the west side of this slide has permanently ceased operations. The facility is currently undergoing closure activities. The gypsum stack circled in red is the original stack for the fertilizer plant. Closure, closure of the stack was completed in 2004. The top of the stack is lined with HDPE and the ponds are used to store processed wastewater. This older stack was not started using newer construction standards, and the bottom of the stack is unlined as it was not required by the state or federal regulations at the time. The gypsum stack circled in green is the former active stack, and it is lined with HDPE on the bottom. At the last meeting, the issue of clays from Hardy County being deposited in clay settling areas, or CSAs, as they're called, in Hillsborough County was brought up during discussion of processed wastewater generated at chemical plants. I will answer the questions, what is the clay material coming into Hillsborough County, and is the process water like that at the chemical facilities? In short, it is a clay slurry coming from the Four Corners Beneficiation Plant located in Hillsborough County and partly in Manatee County. I will explain what a beneficiation plant is later. The slurry is not processed wastewater coming from a chemical plant like at Riverview and Plant City. On July 10th, 2018, Mosaic applied to the BOCC Development Services to amend the development order to allow waste clays originating from other counties to be disposed in existing Hillsborough County clay settling areas. The BOCC voted to approve county staff's recommendation to amend the order. The resolution was adopted on November 19, 2018. Basically, Mosaic continues to commit to balance clay disposal so that the amount of clay that is produced in each county is disposed in that county, with the exception that the clays from Hardy County are authorized to be deposited in designated Hillsborough County CSAs. The composition of clays originating in Hardy County are the same as those mined in Hillsborough County. The capacity of the clay settling areas did not change. Without receiving clays from other counties, these CSAs would not be completely filled to their full design storage capacity prior to completion of mining operation in Hillsborough County. Filling the clay settling areas to their design capacities allows reclamation of the property to be performed in accordance with the design submitted and approved by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Mosaic agreed to not construct four clay settling areas approved for 
the Lonesome Mine area in Hillsborough County. Annual reports are required to be submitted and are reviewed by the County Public Utilities Department. The development order expires November 14, 2023. This is a picture of the Four Corners Beneficiation Plant located near the mining areas in the extreme southeastern part of the county. This is where the mined ore is pumped to, se to separate the phosphate rock from the sand and clays by physical means. The mined ore is roughly one-third sand, one-third clay, and one-third phosphate rock. The phosphate rock is sent to a chemical facility for further processing. This is a very detailed flow diagram of the plant, but the main thing to focus on is that the mined ore, also called the matrix, undergoes many physical processes to remove the clays, which are transported by the mine recirculation system to the clay settling areas. The removed sand is returned to the mine for use and reclamation. The water that decants in the CSAs is returned to the beneficiation plant by the mine recirculation system. The product phosphate rock is transported to the chemical facility for further processing. The differences between a beneficiation plant and a, and a chemical plant are, in the beneficiation plant, phosphate rock is the product. In the chemical plant, phosphate fertilizers are the products. In the beneficiation plant, clays are separated from the mining matrix by physical means, including washing. No chemical changes to the minerals are are made at this point. In the chemical plant, phosphogypsum is a byproduct of reacting the phosphate rock with sulfuric acid. The clays generated at the beneficiation plant are pH neutral and require little treatment to meet water quality standards. The gypsum and processed wastewater gen generated at the chemical plant has a low pH. Water decanted off the clay settling areas is reused in the beneficiation plant. Water decanted from the gypsum stack is reused in the chemical plant. In conclusion, clay settling area water is not comparable to gypsum stack water generated in fertilizer manufacturing plant. This concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Sam L. Robbie is also available at this meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, that is very helpful with the questions that were raised and the questions that we're getting from our uh, constituents in, in, in the wake of the Piney Point disaster. Um, I know we have all been hearing from uh, our, our citizens who are, you know, wonder, wondering about the other phosphate mining and, and uh, uh, processing and stacking <laughs> areas uh, in our county and around our county. And so um, I very much appreciate your um, helping us understand uh, so we can uh, answer some of those questions. Um, and, uh, you know, it's important that we stay on top of what is going on and, and be informed about what is going on in these other areas so we're not surprised um, by, uh, uh, and, and we can understand how best to manage if there's uh, ways we can improve the management. Um, I do have uh, a couple of questions myself, not seeing any um, from the other commissioners. The beneficiation plant at the four corners area in our that's that's in our county in the very southeast area where where mosaic has a a, a large uh land holding isn't that mining is that is that mining going on i mean it, the word mining was not used but the beneficiation isn't that ongoing mining Mining is all around that area. Uh -huh. It's half in Manatee County, half in Hillsborough County, the beneficiation plant. But I'll let uh, Ed or Sam answer that question. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that's a part, the, the actual mining is where the matrix comes from. It's transported in a slurry mm -hmm. to the beneficiation plant where the clay and the sand is removed from the phosphate rock. The um, phosphate rock is the product. Um, 
which is sent on to um, which is sent on to Mosaic Riverview for processing. So it's mined in that area, but then um, the phosphate rock is sent to the Riverview um, uh, area for further processing, and uh, and uh, that's that's what is using the water that is then created the uh, dumped in the stack. C correct. Yes, it's, it's, it first goes to the beneficiation plant, which is very near the which is very near the mines, um, and then it is sent. A, you know, a, a much further distance by rail or truck to um, to Mosaic River Riverview, and that's where you have the chemical processing and um, there that was describing earlier in the presentation, which gypsum is is the byproduct. Thank you. And so the mining has its own impacts, and and in in a very very large area. Um, do we do we have any un, uh, kind of a, a understanding of the timeline of how long that mining will be going on before it's uh, exhausted and they leave that area and and uh, hopefully do some reclamation of the mined lands? Right, Commissioner, we're um, bringing you a presentation um, probably in November about mines outside mining outside the area, facilities, facilities on tributaries. But in this county, mining is, if, if, I'm not sure if it's still occurring, but it's coming to an end in Hillsborough County. Um, and they've moved south to do any active mining. The reclamation, EPC, we have um, staff fully dedicated to going out and um, seeing all the reclamation and releasing it. And sometimes that takes a decade or more to make sure that that site has met the criteria to release. So uh, we work in concert with DEP too, but I'll let uh, Sam take that one. Sam, you're muted. Uh, yeah, commissioners, uh, the, uh, mining in, I'm saying there's an echo that we're fixing that. You're good on this end. Uh, mining in Hillsborough County is waning and it's going away. There's not much phosphate ore in Hillsborough County. Mining is migrating south of our county. That's why the importation of some of the clays coming in to fill existing empty or half empty clay settling areas in Hillsborough County. So we don't have much more mining left for us here. It's kind of uh, going away um, to uh, uh, to fill those existing clay settling areas that are, you know, empty or less than full and be able to reclaim them. So Mosaic is importing that uh, clay from outside to fill those and, and close them because we don't have enough clays, I mean, enough mining in Hillsborough County. I'm not sure how many more years, it's a handful of years left or less. I don't have that information uh, for you today, but uh, it's not a thriving uh, activity in Hillsborough County, and it's uh, something that's going away. Thank you very much. And um, uh, so it's in November that we'll hear kind of a wrap up of w the bigger picture of the some of the uh, phosphate mining activities that are going on outside our county and um, uh, remnants like uh, Piney Point, um, which is just across the county line in Manatee County, but also um, uh, the the old uh, mosaic plant, at, uh, I think it was Cargill before at New Wales, and that is just one mile from the county line, I believe, and um, uh, th they've also had um, events from uh, that big sinkhole that developed a while back and, and uh, 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 spilled um, water into the um, aquifer, uh, polluted water into the aquifer, but, and they just had a uh, tank spill, I believe there, is that? But anyway, we'll be having, they, they've had a few problems and we'll be um, hearing about that in uh, uh, those outer um, 
nearby phosphate operations in November. Yes, yes, Commissioner. All right, and uh, Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. It was, I'm gonna have to go back about three times to mm -hmm. um, really kind of absorb it all, but um, just a couple of, and I know you'll be doing another one. So um, just, uh, um, I know the, I know um, you had said the phosphate industry is moving south, but it's not really, it's more, it looks like more it's moving east, I think. I'm just wondering because it's not really moving to Manatee County so much for mining and everything, is it? Well, it's well, east and south. You have, is it moving into Manatee? I'll let Sam answer that. I, there, there was I was just curious. Manatee and Hardy County. Yeah. I'm sorry? Uh, it's in Manatee and Hardy County. Okay, because I wasn't um, I wasn't sure about the Manatee. That's why I was asking specifically. Um, and then, um, in terms of the processing for, I know something was said there about the processing for water. I know it's kind of water intensive once you mine. Um, I think I once heard permitting in Hillsborough County, a twenty five million gallons a day, which is pretty, it's a pretty big number. Um, and then there was talk here about reusing the water, which obviously would make sense, but I thought that they needed to um, have water, like right from the aquifer in order to dilute uh, the, uh, the to, to make it so that they could uh, then put that water, uh, that it was diluted enough to, you know, have it be, uh, safe to release. I don't know. I, I'd like to understand that process a little more. I've understood that the permitting was quite 25 million gallons is quite extensive, but I understand they don't. They have a permit for that, but they don't really use it. And then I was um, interested in, you know, that they used it from the benefication plants and and then reused it at the processing uh, part. But I like to understand more of that. I know I heard um, some during this Piney Point of that there were possibilities, and I don't know what's happening with Piney Point now, but that there was expensive but possible ways to kind of totally decommission that site by taking the water that's there, and there's still quite a bit of water there, and for our other uh, gypsum stacks, and somehow, I guess, uh, drying it up. Um, you know some some types of processes and I'd like to understand if that's really possible and you know um, how that could be done and I know the phosphate industry has changed quite a bit not just it's not focused on Polk and Hillsboro anymore but in other places and it's moving um, and so I'm, I'm uh, looking at all that but as I understand it's kind of like you know, 20 years ago, I heard that it was only in this area and in Morocco that even phosphate existed. And now they've found phosphate resources all over the world. So I guess in South America and China and other places that they're mining their own instead of coming from here or Morocco. And that that's really changed the industry quite a bit. So now they're doing the processing like they're doing in Riverview um, for uh, pellets. And instead of serving a lot of the world they're serving, I think, a lot of North America, um, and I'm not sure, some South America. I don't know. It'd be, it'd be kind of interesting to understand that um, part of the industry since it's such a big uh, part here. Um, and I, I'm just, um, go, you know, this is uh, such a complex uh, thing. But one thing I'd really like to understand as well is I know that 100 years ago when they were doing strip mining and processing in Polk County, uh, and now some of that land has been built on uh, homes. Um, and then there's the radon, there's um, questions about the stability of the ground when the, that even after centuries, or a century, maybe decades, I should say, saturated, I know that we probably that that's um, probably been refined and, and um, gotten better. But one of my questions is, 
<laughs> because I've heard contrasting, uh, conflicting information, is so when an area is strip mined or processed or watered or whatever, um, and then it's reclaimed, um, when can, is it advisable, does it happen all the time, that um, then neighborhoods or communities are built on top of that land? I, that, I would like to understand a little bit more about that. Okay, Commissioner, we'll, I've, I've taken notes and we'll bring those back in a future presentation. I know that's a lot of questions yeah. or whatever. <laughs> yeah, the, the water aspect is, is just a presentation in and of itself. Yes, so I know it's quite, so I was following that and trying to follow a little bit yeah. more. I'm, I'm just going all over the place with this because it's. Well, and, and as far as um, the stability in the ground, we'll, we'll, we'll look into that. But the, we'll, we'll bring these back in future presentations. And we do have uh, Reggie Sanford. Uh, Sam was going to introduce him to answer Commissioner Cohen's on the radioactivity of the gypsum. So um, but if anybody doesn't have any further questions, he's the next presenter. I've got um, uh, Commis Commissioner White in the queue. Commissioner White, you're recognized. Thank you very much. Well, I, I feel like I know the Four Corners mine area pretty well because it's in my district. It's in a town known as Fort Lonesome, uh, although I believe they have a Lithia zip code. But um, you, you all have heard me refer to Fort Lonesome a lot uh, rhetorically when I'm referring to the, the far stretches of the county in my district. And the, 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 the mine, its name, the Four Corners Mine, is, is named for the fact that the four corners of Hillsborough County, Manatee County, Polk County, and Hardy County come together right there. So there's absolutely mining going on in all four of those counties, Hillsborough, Polk, Manatee, and Hardy. Uh, the issue of bringing in the um, clay settling material from Hardy to our clay settling ponds in Hillsboro was, was controversial. Um, that was dealt with uh, by the county commission at a land use meeting, I, I forget how many number of years ago. But uh, mining is uh, about to wrap up in Hillsborough County. I hear that we have, maybe staff can tell me if I'm correct, but I've heard we probably have less than a decade to go and we'll be finished here. And this is definitely a conversation for another day, possibly even for a BOCC meeting versus an EPC meeting. But, you know, that's going to lead this board to uh, some major policy decisions. Uh, number one is what happens to all that land? I believe Mosaic's land holdings out there in eastern Hillsborough County is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 50,000 acres staff can fact check me on that as well but it seems like i've heard a number of about fifty thousand acres uh, that land uh, i believe will have to go through a reclamation process i know a lot of it has already been dedicated to elap particularly along the uh, banks of the little manatee river uh, but there's the reclamation issue and then what happens with that land long term, right? So there will be some major, major land use policy decisions to make. Um, I'll be gone, unfortunately. I would really uh, enjoy being a part of that process. It's currently outside the urban service area with rural density entitlements, but you know that's something to think about. And when it comes to the budget, for the newer commissioners that aren't aware, um, there's a tax levy on the mine material known as the phosphate severance tax. And that's, a, in the grand scheme of things, a relatively small fund within our budget. But Ms. Doherty, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that we use, or traditionally have used anyway, some of the phosphate severance tax revenues to fund some EPC operations and activities. So that's something to think about long term as well, because that fund has already been dwindling for a number of years because of the decreased mining activity. Obviously, once the mining wraps up, there's no mining and those revenues will go to zero, as I understand it. Correct. Um, you know, subject to whatever the fund balance looks like. And it's my understanding that the fund balance is already getting pretty low. So we're on a trajectory for that fund to be at zero. And I just point that out because I, you know, have just about 14 months left on this board. But, you know, you'll want to think about how to how to fund uh, the things that the phosphate severance tax revenues are currently funding and how to keep those operations going. So there are a lot of 
policy implications, some of which I consider to be major ones to think about uh, as mining wraps up in Hillsboro um, within the next decade, which as we all know, will, will come pretty quickly. So anyway, that's my two cents worth on everything. Thank you. And um, I'm hoping that wherever you are after 14 months that um, <laughs> you will still be available for consultation on those, uh, all those matters in that area that you've become so familiar with um, and, and this topic that you've uh, become so familiar with. So um, uh, don't, uh, don't think you can get an unlisted number. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's very kind of you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cohen, you're recognized. Yeah, I, I just, I want to uh, thank Commissioner White for those comments. Um, I, about a week or two ago, I actually went out to the Four Corners area and toured some of the land that has been reclaimed already and remediated. And I, I, your point is so well taken about what this board is gonna have in front of us. This is beautiful, beautiful, pristine land that is filled with wildlife and all sorts of specimens of trees, uh, wetlands, it, it, it's just spectacular. And we, um, we are gonna have the ability, I think, to determine what happens to all of that land eventually. And there's nothing that says that it can't be left in a, in a natural state in order to be enjoyed for recreational activities or, or uh, as a wildlife refuge or for ELAP purposes. So um, I, I think it's great that, that everyone can start thinking about uh, what that's going to look like in the next decade because um, I was uh, just uh, really sort of blown away by just the, the, the beauty of the natural environment that is, uh, that is out there, so. Excellent point. Uh, we have uh, reclaimed um, and, and uh, preserved uh, so, some previously mined land in the ELAB program. I myself have nominated tens of th thousands of acres, I think, of uh, mosaic owned land. And we have even uh, re uh, acquired some of that. Um, so uh, good point. And um, seeing no other hand raised, Ms. Doherty, do you wanna wrap that up and, and move to the next one? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner, you are right. There are uh, a couple of staff that are dedicated to that phosphate severance tax funding. Um, there's, with the mining decreasing in Hillsborough, the fin ha fund has dwindled. The county also has staff that review. You get DRIs every year from Mosaic, so you have development services staff. I think you have some park staff that are dedicated to that funding, which is an interesting, um, you know, add, you'd have to have the county tell you how they're appropriating their money. Our money goes specifically for people who are going out and going to release the mitigation sites and have to visit them. And, and when you're talking about it, it's tens of thousands of acres that you have to go out onto every year. And for releasing these sites, it takes decades. So commissioner, that's an interesting phenomena that the fund is dwindling down, but the, the dedication that you have to have to those mitigation sites that go on in perpetuity and to visit them, all of that acreage annually to make sure they're meeting the criteria that that job will continue on. So that is something that you may want to look at in the future as well, because the reclamation point part is very important to have our staff involved in making sure that what's occurring is what was proposed. So they're achieving their goals on mitigation. And I will let you know, Mosaic has given uh, us, APC has many conservation easements on that land as well as some that has been purchased by ELAP, but we'll bring that back for a future presentation. And I'll let Sam introduce uh, Mr. Samford. Uh, commissioners, again, this is a continuation of uh, last month's discussion. And the next presentation will be uh, given to us by Peggy Samford, who's an assistant director of the air division with 31 years of experience and it has to do with radiation impacts from uh, chipsum stacks 
Uh, Reggie has completed projects and coursework in the field of radiation and is here to address the question raised in the last month meeting. Reggie. Thank you, Sam. Good morning, commissioners. If I may share my screen with you. At the last meeting, <clears throat> you raised questions, as Sam mentioned, concerning radiation emanating from the JIT stack. Um, I'm here to address those questions and also summarize a study uh, that we conducted in conjunction with the Florida Department of Health on the JIT stacks. Specifically, you asked how long until all the radioactive material is inert and the impacts of radiation on a closed stack. So before I address the question, I want to be sure we're all on the same page as to what we're discussing when we say radiation. This is an illustration of a stable atom, uh, you know, the, the lowest uh, form of an element, if you remember from you know, early science class. Uh, there's a nucleus that contains protons and neutrons, and the electrons orbit the nucleus in the outer shells. All these particles are tightly held together by binding energy. Radiation is the result of a spontaneous breakdown or disintegration of that atom, making it unstable. So when this occurs, the atom releases energy through the emission of either charged particles or electromagnetic waves in the form of X-rays and gamma rays. Um, and like I say, this is part of the energy that binds it together. The reason radiation is so rightfully feared is because this energy can come into contact with our bodies and alter our DNA, uh, which obviously can lead to cancer and other ailments. Here is a list of trace radioactive elements typically associated with gym stacks. It's my understanding that radium-226 is the most abundant on this list. So what happens on the JIT stack is that you have a number of different elements. Uh, they're in the form of metals, semi-metals, and one gas that are in various stages of breakdown or decay. Uh, remember, you know, the atom is unstable. They're constantly releasing uh, this radioact radioactive energy. And the radiation from each element will take time, uh, varying amounts of times, in order for it to dissipate. So what scientists have done is estimate the amount of time it takes for half the radiation to dissipate. This is called the half-life. And as you can see, uh, in the case of uranium, uh, for half of a sample of uranium to dissipate it, it will take over four and a half billion years. But in the case of other elements, it may take seconds or fractions of a second. So to answer the first part of your question, when do the radiation levels in the chip stack become inert? The answer is basically never. The stack will always have some type of uh, radioactivity associated with it. As you can see, um, the half-life of the dominant uh, element in that mix is radium, and it's almost 1,600 years just for half of it uh, to dissipate. But keep in mind, radiation occurs naturally. It's all around us. We live with it. It's in our food, it's in our water, it's in the air. Um, we're impacted um, by photon um, energy from the sun. So radiation is a part of our you know, natural environment. The difference is when it comes to you know, the phosphogypsum is that when they process the phosphate rock, uh, that process uh, leaves a product that is technically enhanced or slightly more radioactive than background. So what companies do to deal with this is that um, they deal with it through engineering controls. They try to make sure to maintain a distance between the stack and where you know residents live. And um, these are things that they can do to you know reduce the exposure and the impact. And the phosphogypsum itself, when it's you know deposited on, on the slide on the stack. Uh, it's usually in almost like a slurry form, or what happens is that that material hardens and it acts as a shield to, you know, further reduce uh, the levels. 
to answer the second part of your question about radiation's impact on an unlined stack, uh, we've been in communication with the State Health Department. They have a unit called the Bureau of Radiation Control. They tell us that the concentrated material on these unlined stacks is somewhat settled under their own weight and that the Florida aquifer does a pretty good job of diluting uh, the radioactive material. As you know, that body of water underneath the ground is constantly moving. Um, they said DEP, you know, if the question were to be asked of DEP, they would probably be more concerned about the short-term effects of spillage or a collapse of the pond leading to algae blooms and also uh, leading to shellfish, shellfish exposure uh, then increased level of radioactivity in groundwater. So the bottom line on the entire uh, radiation issue is that it ultimately doesn't go away. Uh, it can only be diluted, which will lessen its effects. Uh, and then I'd, I'd like for you to also keep in mind, you know, that it's here naturally in varying concentrations, you know, all across the world. Uh, one other thing in speaking with Ms. Doherty that she wanted me to mention, uh, was to let you know of a study that we conducted several years ago on these very stacks. Between 2003 and 2013 uh, time period in response to one of the DRI requirements and at the behest of Commissioner uh, Lewis Miller, we conducted a study to determine if the surface dust and radiation from the, you know, the surface of these chip stacks were negatively impacting schools and uh, nearby residents. Specifically, what Air Division staff did was monitor for increases in transit dust levels, and the Bureau of Radiation Control monitored for increases in ambient radon gas and gamma energy levels from the uh, active stacks. We first looked at whether or not it's a possible increase in the transit dust levels from the JIP stack to see if the surrounding communities were being subject to higher levels. Uh, we did this using our existing monitors. Uh, the, the green triangles are our existing monitors. And then we also added temporary monitors to better cover the area. And you can see we had a temporary monitor down at Gibsonton Elementary School and also at Progress uh, Village uh, Middle School. Our monitoring results determined that there were no notable dust impacts on the schools as a result of the JIP stack. So if you look at uh, the green bars, you can see that, you know, Progress Village, which, which was the closest school, um, you know, it's almost like the worst case scenario, the dust levels were actually lower than the uh, monitors that we have in other areas. The Bureau of Radiation Control then monitored to determine if ambient radon gas and gamma energy were at higher levels at the schools and at the communities. So we monitored the radon because it's the byproduct of radian. And recall, recall uh, in that decay chain I showed you earlier that listed the typical elements that are found on the JIPS tag, the most prevalent is radian. And what happens is that radium decays, it breaks down into radon. Radon is gas, and it's the only uh oh, did he get muted? Reggie, are you muted? Reggie can you hear us? Whoops. We, we have lost Reggie's audio. Okay. Okay. Reggie, are you muted? Sorry. There you go. Okay. Can you hear me? We Everyone? can hear you now. Yes, we can. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, so maybe I'll back up just one point. I just wanted to mention that, you know, radon is, is a gas that can't be smelled, tasted, or seen, and it's always present in the atmosphere. Uh, the primary reason for concern when it comes to radon is that when it's inhaled, it can deposit energy through what... 
Uh oh. He's having problems. Reggie, if you can hear us, you're going in and out with your audio. If we can't Reggie. get Reggie, can you hear us? Two study periods and in both. Reggie? The average measure. Excuse me, Reggie? Yes. You're breaking, you're breaking in and out right now with your audio. Okay, I'm not sure. What should I do? Just keep going. Okay. Can you Let go back to can you go back to the elementary school slide? Yes. One slide back. There you go. And just finish up that slide and then proceed. If you go out again, maybe we'll just have Sterling pick it up if he's online. Okay. So we, you were talking about radon gas being tasteless and, and all of those things. Yeah, we're having problems. Sterling, are you on? Sterling, yes, I'm on. I'm here. And the way I'll wrap it up is essentially the question that you had was about when does it become an earth? It doesn't. But what Reggie was going <laughs> to say. The point I wanted to mention is that radon gas can travel, you know, great distances because it is a gas. Okay. Are we okay? Keep going. Okay. Uh, the Bureau did two study periods. The average measured school uh, rate on levels were actually lower than the levels that are found on the gyp stack and at the control site. Uh, because there's no outdoor standard, what we did was compare it to an EPA. If I may uh, make a suggestion. Yeah. I uh, it, sometimes it's helpful if the person having trouble like this just goes to audio without sharing their screen That's right. and then maybe you could have uh, somebody else share their screen and and uh, uh, Mr. Sanford could could be saying next slide right without well, uh, James Brewer has the slides and he could do that if he want if he wanted to I think we're pretty much at the end here so um, We'll let Sterling go forward with the slides, I think, because we can hear Sterling. So, Sterling, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say from that previous slide, when we looked at a control site and compared it to the levels at the school and around the gypsum stack, all those levels were well below EPA's action level of that four picocuries per liter. And they were essentially almost what we found at the background control site at City. So, the truth of it is, is get a certain distance away from the gypsum stack uh, at the schools and at the residences, those levels moved down to background because of the crusting and because of the distance. So there was no real uh, environmental concern based on those studies that we did back in 2010 and 2015. So then when you look at the next slide that Reggie had, it was actually comparing the radiation levels around the gypsum stack and comparing it to what you would get, you know, flying on a plane or either eating a banana because like Reggie said radiation is something that is part of our background it's in the environment but the issue is is trying to make sure that people are sufficient distance away from the gypsum stacks so they're not negatively impacted okay well I think okay, that's it. Can anyone hear me now? We can, but Sterling wrapped it up for you, Reggie. Reggie, you did a great job. Unfortunately, uh, there were some technical difficulties, but Sterling kind of wrapped it up in a nutshell for us. Okay. Uh, if I could just say the conclusion was that uh, there were no uh, need to take any type of remedial action. That's what DOH concluded. Um, and also, I just wanted to point out to everyone that once we concluded the study, assuming everyone can hear me. Um, we reached out to the citizenry, uh, brought them up, them up to speed on what we were doing and communicated that at three separate community meetings. Awesome. Thank you, Reggie. And I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. <laughs> it must be my internet. It happens. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> let me stop sharing. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I think we got the the gist of it, and and importantly, 
Um, let me ask this. The, the monitoring continues um, of uh, air quality throughout the county, I including this, um, uh, this monitoring here, right? It's ongoing? I'm not sure about the radon. Mm -hmm. Right, that's correct. We monitor for what EPA calls criteria pollutants, which correct. are tied to public health. And then we do special monitoring that includes maybe another 100 uh, pollutants. But the radon study was a one-time thing uh, that we did um, as a requirement of a DRI that was issued to Mosaic. Uh, what they were doing at the time was they wanted permission to expand their stack and um, DRI said they needed to do this radar monitoring. So it was a one-time effort. Thank you. Um, thank you, Commissioner. And uh, Commissioner Cohen, you're recognized. Well, thank you, Commissioner Smith, because that was going to be my question uh, also. And thank you for that presentation. It was great. And notwithstanding the technical difficulties, I, th I think we were able to understand what was said. So since there has not been a radon study since 2013, we're now eight years past when we last looked at it. And I, I was going to suggest not to go spending any newfound money or anything, but, you know, we, we do have some money. We, we were informed that we have some money left over this year. Funding another study to, to double check and make sure that we're still way below levels might not be a bad idea. It's been eight years since this was done. And, you know, you've, if, it's, if it's tasteless and odorless, <laughs> it's going to take a while before it reveals itself. And... This, this might be something that we ought to look at. I'm just going to throw that out for the board's consideration. It might be more appropriate for the Board of County Commissioners to take it up, but it might not be a bad idea for us to, to fund another study like this and just double check and make sure a decade later that we're, that we're still in the same place. I wonder if uh, that, that's a, a very good thought. I wonder if we can get back what the cost of that would be and any uh, staff recommendations on the value of doing that now rather than later um, and just have a, a, a brief item um, to that effect. We can bring that back in October uh -huh. for you. That would be great. Thank you. Be, yes, and I'll reach out to Administrator Weiss. This was part of the DRI process, but you don't have a DRI in front of you. So we'll reach out to all the partners who did that and see, you know, the cost and how to implement that. Good idea. Right. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, seeing no other questions or comments, um, I hand it back to you, Ms. Doherty, to take uh, us further. All right. Well, the, 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 the final uh, part of this trilogy is the Tampa Bay Seagrass update, and Sam will introduce our next speaker. Oh. Commissioner Sam and Robbie again. And the last presentation we have for you today is uh, about seagrass status update in the Bay Area, and it will be given by Dr. Chris Anastasio, who is the Chief Water Quality Scientist and the Seagrass Mapping Program Lead at the Southwest Florida Water Management District. He is a graduate of USF and whose dissertation focused on numerical optical modeling of shallow water estuaries, so uh, he's the expert on the subject. And also I would like to thank him for his service. He is an officer in the United States Naval Reserve. With that, Dr. Anastasio. Doctor, you muted. Sorry about that. I thought I would be slick and uh, share my screen <coughs> first, but I'll go ahead and share it now. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Sam. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam uh, Commissioner and uh, members of the uh, EPC. Thank you uh, for inviting me to, to uh, come and share the uh, results of our 2020 seagrass uh, mapping effort. <laughs> what I'm going to do is just take a few minutes to first kind of give you a little bit of an overview of what the seagrass mapping program is all about at the district and then uh, show you the results uh, from this effort. 
So uh, the district's been mapping seagrass since 1988. So we have one of the most comprehensive seagrass mapping programs, I think, anywhere really in the world. It has grown uh, substantially over the years. Uh, we really have two regions of our district, which cover 16 counties that you see on the right. Uh, we have the northern region that we call the Springs Coast, and that's roughly from Anklo Key north to Wakasasa Bay. And then the region that we call the Sun Coast, which goes from Tampa Bay, uh, St. Joseph Sound, Clearwater Harbor, south to Charlotte Harbor. Uh, that Sun Coast region is the region I'll be talking about today. And that's the area that we've been mapping for quite some time. Uh, in 2007 is when we started mapping the Springs Coast region. And uh, we mapped the Springs Coast region on a four-year cycle. Uh, from Tampa Bay South, what we call the Sun Coast, uh, we map on a two-year cycle. So what I'll be presenting you today are the results from our fiscal year 2020 mapping effort. And then I'll talk a little bit about what's coming up for the FY22 mapping effort. So there's, there's really three, uh, I guess, flavors of uh, what goes, that goes into seagrass mapping. So we have the acquisition phase, we have the photo interpretation phase, and then we have the field verification phase. Now, these three uh, don't happen independent of one another. So there's a lot of overlap uh, across a, a seagrass mapping cycle. But I'm just going to touch on each of these briefly before I go into the results. So the first is obviously acquisition. So the way the district maps seagrass is we do it via fixed aircraft. So we collect digital imagery. Um, plane flies at about 9,000 feet altitude. And uh, that's how we collect the imagery that is later photo interpreted. We have a very uh, specific set of what we call go, no go criteria for our flight. Um, it's dependent on weather, it's dependent on tides. Um, we do an intensive, almost daily uh, monitoring of water clarity across all the estuaries that we map. And we do that in concert with our partners. So we're, we're very fortunate um, to work very closely with local governments, with the state, uh, with uh, other entities that provide really critical information during that uh, flight window period. So for 2020, the flight window uh, started in November 1st of 2019 to the end of February in 2020. So when uh, I present the data to you all, keep that in mind that what you're seeing is the results of imagery that was collected across the winter of 1920. Um, that's important because of uh, atmospheric conditions and, and other clarity conditions. It's optimal in the winter, and that's why we collect the imagery at that time. There's also a lot of post-processing that goes into uh, the collection of these images. So this isn't just a, a, an aerial image that we just collect. For other purposes, these images are collected specifically for the purpose of mapping seagrass. And so there's a lot of color balancing that goes into it, pixel stretching, edge matching. And then ultimately what happens is we create uh, an image mosaic. So that's all those images that are stitched together to create a seamless product that is then used uh, for the photo interpreters to map the seagrass. Now, while this is going on, there are uh, a lot of field operations that are taking place. So we have three types of what we call field verification. The first is the photo interpreters that uh, actually go out and ground through the areas that they have concerns with. So we, we have areas of concern. We know that we're going to have imagery that might be a little difficult to look at when we do the photo interpretation. So the photo interpreters or the PIs will go out there and they will check those areas. Uh, examples of those areas would be things like passes. Um, anytime you get a, a large pass and you've got water coming in and out, there's a lot of turbidity and things like that. So it affects the clarity of the water. Other areas are, are areas where we know there are uh, large uh, uh, areas of drift algae, for example, that might make it more difficult to, to uh, map the photographic signature of the seagrass. So they come on and do that. Just to give you an idea of, of how many points, just for the photo interpretation um, in this 2020 effort, um, the photo interpreters visited over 900 points. Um, so it's, it's a pretty intensive effort. Now along with that, there's also what we call the quality control spot checks. And those are primarily driven by um, staff at the district, myself and, and my team. And we'll go out usually towards the end of the mapping uh, cycle in order to check areas that we know uh, are areas of interest. And so we work very closely with our local uh, partners 
for example, EPC and uh, the counties and, and the SRA programs to go out to areas where we're seeing things that uh, we need to go and verify and make sure that we understand what those signatures really are. And then the final uh, field verification piece is what we call the independent accuracy assessment. And this is a, a field uh, component that is completely independent of the photo interpreters. So we have a, typically as a subcontractor, um, they do a statistical analysis of the areas being mapped and they choose points that are then used to uh, measure the accuracy of the map before we accept the map product as, as final. And so those are kind of the three levels of field verification. Now in 2020, because of COVID, uh, things were delayed, but we did manage to get uh, all the field work completed in a safe, uh, socially distanced manner. So, so we were a little bit behind schedule for 2020, but uh, we, did, uh, we were able to go out in the field and collect the data that we needed. So while that's going on, then that we try to do the field verification work uh, either during or shortly after the, the period of acquisition because we want to capture what was there on the ground when the plane flew overhead. Once all that's done, then we start the photo interpretation phase. And the thing to remember, while well, when I show you the results of the 2020 maps and compare them to historical maps, uh, remember these are based on photographic signatures. So. It, we are mapping seagrass based on what it looks like on, on a photograph. Uh, and the way we do that is we classify these areas based on the Florida Land Use uh, Mapping Convention. So they're modified flux codes. And uh, this example, which you'll see in a second again, is an example of what we call 9113, which is the patchy uh, seagrass code. We have more than just these three mapping conventions, but I, I thought just for ease, uh, and simplicity, and, and since these are ultimately seagrass maps, we would focus primarily on our seagrass codes, which is 9116 and 9113. So continuous, as the picture that you see there uh, would indicate, is an area that has a uniform signature of, of uh, grass that has less than 25% open area or sand bottom, if you will. So that's what really defines a continuous seagrass bed. 9113 is a patchy bed, which is really more of a discontinuous bed. And so this is the same image that you saw on the previous slide. You can see the patches have those yellow polygons drawn around them. That's a classic example of what a, a patchy seagrass meadow would look like from an aerial image. And that's E.G. Simmons Park, just to the south, in case you were wondering where that was. And then the last uh, mapping convention that I'm going to talk about today is the 9121, which is what we call attached algae. And you'll see in a minute why this is significant. Um, attached algae, and the, and the picture that you see there in, on the right is uh, what is called Calerpa proliferans. Calerpa is a very common native attached algae that we see in the estuaries uh, off the Gulf uh, West Coast of Florida. Um, it does coexist with seagrass, but sometimes it can become a dominant feature as well. And so when that Calerpa becomes a dominant feature, we will map it as 9121. And so you don't have to remember the codes, I'll talk you through them, but what we're going to do is we're going to go through uh, each of, of the, uh, the, the maps for Tampa Bay. But before we do that, I, I also thought it'd be interesting for, for you all to see basically where Tampa Bay sits with uh, relative to the other estuaries. So again, we're only showing Sun Coast, which is Clearwater Harbor, St. Joseph Sound, to Charlotte Harbor. And so comparing the 2018 uh, acreage estimates, and these acres are both the 9116 and the 9113 combined. So what you see here are the numbers for both patchy and continuous seagrass. So we add those two numbers together to get the total acreage. And so you can see that really across the board, we, we've seen a, a negative percent change uh, in all the estuaries that we've mapped along the Sun Coast. Clearwater Harbor, St. Joseph Sound, not that much. 2% is, is really uh, little to no change. It's, it's, it's within the noise of the map itself. But you can see Tampa Bay, we saw 16% uh, a change, which translates to over 6,000 acre uh, reduction in seagrass. Sarasota Bay saw an 18% reduction, and the largest loss we saw uh, across the Sun Coast was Charlotte Harbor with a loss of over 4,400 acres, and that corresponds to about a 23% change 
between the 2018 maps and the 2020 maps. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you Tampa Bay specifically. And what we do in each of these estuaries is we break them down into base segments. So Tampa Bay is broken down into several base segments, which you'll see in a minute. So this map shows you all the base segments. And these are uh, mostly consistent with the base segments that the Tampa Bay Estuary Program uses. We, we, are, we try to standardize our segmentation scheme. They're, they're slightly different for different reasons. But for the most part, these should be familiar. Old Tampa Bay, Hillsborough Bay, Middle Tampa Bay, Lower Tampa Bay, and then uh, Boca Ciega, Terracia, and uh, the Manatee River. So what you're looking at here is the 2018 seagrass map. So this is where the grasses uh, were mapped in 2018. The dark green is the continuous, that, that uh, thicker grass bed that you saw in the photograph. And then the 9113 is the lighter green color, which is the, the, uh, what we would call patchy uh, grass beds. Uh, the table on the right shows you what the numbers look like in 2018, and the graph on the bottom right shows you the, the, the long-term trend. So we actually have data in Tampa Bay that goes back to 82. We took over the program in 1988 and continued to do so. But you can see that the trend from 1982 all the way to 2016 has been uh, positive. 2018 saw a slight dip from 2016, but now when we add the 2020 maps, you can see that uh, reflected, uh, that you can see that, that sharper drop between 18 and 20. Uh, I want to go back real quick because I want to draw your attention to the map on the left. So remember the green and the light green, dark green, light green, seagrass. The uh, bluish green color is that attached algae that I showed you. Now when we fast forward to 2020, you can see a lot of those green areas, especially in old Tampa Bay, and to a lesser extent in Hillsborough Bay and, and that upper portion of Middle Tampa Bay, turn blue-green. So that, those are the areas largely that represent the loss. So we, that 16% loss was largely due to the conversion of uh, Old Tampa Bay from seagrass to attached algae. I'll go back real quick and see. So you see uh, 2018 green. 2020, a lot of that blue-green, and that's where we see the, the majority of the loss. So most of the loss of seagrass in Tampa Bay is, is really focused on old Tampa Bay. You can see that from this chart that old Tampa Bay, we saw over 4,000 acre loss of grass. That's about a 38% change from 18 to 20 in old Tampa Bay. Now, Hillsborough Bay also had a big percent change, 43%. Uh, but that translates to about 627 acres. That's significant for Hillsborough Bay, but overall, uh, it, it doesn't really drive the trend downward. Old Tampa Bay is really where we saw the greatest loss. Uh, Middle Tampa Bay also saw a loss of about 1,000 acres. So uh, those are the areas where we're seeing the largest losses, and I wanted to focus on Old Tampa Bay. You know, we talk about the persistent pyridinium blooms. We've talked about you know, some of the chlorophyll issues in Old Tampa Bay. And this is where we saw almost a one-to-one -one swap from seagrass in 2018 to attached algae in 2020. So you can see we lost over 4,000 acres of grass, but we gained over 4,000 acres of attached algae. And so we're working uh, closely with our partners, the estuary program, government, CPC, to, to really kind of wrap our brains around what this means. And ultimately, you know, what do we need to do about it? What can be done uh, in terms of you know, moving that needle back to seagrass as opposed to attached algae? So in summary, uh, we did see you know, a, a fairly large loss in seagrass between 2018 and 2020. Um, this is consistent with the estuaries to the south, so Sarasota Bay, Lama Bay, Charlotte Harbor. So this loss is a regional phenomenon. It's not something that's specific to just Tampa Bay. Uh, that does represent a 10-year low of 34,297 acres, and that actually puts us below the Tampa Bay estuaries target, which originally was set at 38,000 acres, which, which was based on 1950s acreage estimates and then upgraded in 2020 to 40,000 acres. So we are now below that target. Um, we did see, again, Old Tampa Bay reporting the greatest loss uh, between 18 and 20. And largely, uh, Boca Ciega Bay, Terracilla Bay, and Lower Tampa Bay 
were relatively unchanged. We did see some minor losses in Boca Ciega and Terracia. Lower Tampa Bay was less than a 1% change, which for, uh, for us, that represents really no change in seagrass. And, and typically, that's, that's not unexpected in those lower Tampa Bay regions, where the grass tends to be a lot more stable uh, than in the old Tampa Bay and Hillsborough Bay segments. So what's coming up on the horizon? So uh, I, I, I try not to call this a seagrass uh, mapping project because it's really a program. It, it's a cycle uh, that, that just continues. So we're, we wrapped up the Sun Coast, we're wrapping up the Springs Coast for FY20, and we're now getting ready to roll into the 22 map. So the planning is underway. Our flight window opens on December 1st of this year. So we'll be flying planes uh, potentially as early as December 1st, and that window closes on February 28th of next year. Uh, because of COVID, uh, there were some delays in getting the maps out this past cycle. Uh, we are targeting uh, at, at, at the latest a fall 2022 release, at least for the draft maps for Tampa Bay um, and the other estuaries uh, to the south as well. So we're really trying to compress the schedule so folks don't have to wait as long to get the results. As you can imagine, a lot of people are, are waiting to see what the 22 maps are going to bring us, especially since we've seen red tide, as you've heard before, and of course the Piney Point uh, event that occurred earlier this year. So uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, again, I, I want to thank all of our partners throughout the Sun Coast. Uh, we can't do this alone. So we, we interact uh, quite frequently. During the, the mapping and the acquisition, we're, we're interacting almost daily with our partners to, to get feedback and to get data and to, and to just get uh, you know, on the ground reports of what's going on. And that really does help make our product better. So I, I always want to take time to thank everybody. And this is by far not an exhaustive list of, of all the partners that we have. Um, if you are interested in the, uh, the data, they are available on our uh, open data portal. That's the link. Uh, you, can, you can download the shape files. You can bring them into ArcGIS. Um, and everything really is available from 1982 to 2020. These data are also available on Water Atlas. I'm not sure if they updated them to the 2020 maps, but um, our seagrass layers are also available on the Tampa Bay Water Atlas as well. And we are working on uh, producing a, a static PDF map that will be available as well so that uh, you can just download that and, and get a kind of a poster version of the seagrass uh, areas in, in Tampa Bay and, and the other estuaries as well. Uh, I know that's a lot of information. If you have any questions, uh, if there's time, I'm happy to entertain them at this, at this time. If you, could, if you think of anything after the meeting that you'd like to uh, discuss, I'm available. Give me a call, shoot me an email, and I'm happy to, uh, to talk to you more about the mapping process and the results as well. So with that, thank you again for uh, giving me the opportunity to come and present the 2020 maps, and I look forward to coming back for the 22 results. Thank you so much, Mr. Anastasio. It is uh, great to see you again. It's been a while, but um, I will say that we are, are very fortunate to have um, uh, you with your uh, extensive experience in uh, Swift Mud and, and Tampa Bay um, spending time with us this morning. Thank you so much for for being here and um, informing us about this. Um, before I uh, turn over to a couple of commissioners with questions, let me just ask you to briefly uh, back up in the context uh, and set this loss of seagrass in a, in a small, uh, a brief bit of context of the value of seagrasses. Because I saw, uh, for example, in your uh, photograph of the uh, uh, continuous seagrass bed, the lush uh, uh, seagrass that, that we uh, aspire to everywhere, um, a photo of a, uh, that there happened to be a scallop uh, resting on those grasses. And I, I would like you to just, um, you know, for the benefit of, of anybody viewing this presentation and uh, now or at another time, uh, set a little bit of context of the importance of seagrass, the value of seagrass, and um, 
why this uh, this loss matters. Sure, yeah, my pleasure. And you know, full disclosure, that picture was taken on the Springs Coast, not in Tampa Bay. Mm -hmm. So that, that there's a tasty scallop in that picture. Mm -hmm. uh, and I and I do agree. I think it underscores the importance of seagrass, both economically and ecologically. Uh, the reason why uh, the district maps seagrass and has been doing this now for over 30 years is because it, it's what we consider the, the canary in the estuary, so to speak. If, if those of you are familiar with the analogy of the canary in the coal mine, uh, seagrass provide us with a, a, what I would consider a synoptic level, a, a large area snapshot of the, the overall health of an estuary. And that's why it's such a key indicator of how, in this case, Tampa Bay is faring. So when we see losses of seagrass, that sends up an alarm that says something is going on, we need to pay attention to it. Um, the reason why seagrass are such a, an indicator is really twofold. Number one, they're, they're sensitive to changes in water clarity. That was talked about earlier with respect to the ongoing pyridinium blooms in Old Tampa Bay and their effect on light attenuation. So uh, they're a good indicator of, of the quality of the water columns. So that's one big reason why we're interested in mapping seagrass and why they're used as such, as such an effective planning tool. They're not the only tool, so I, I will also caution that it, you know, seagrass aren't the end all, but they are a, an excellent barometer of how an estuary is doing. Uh, but while they are sensitive to water quality, they also help regulate water quality because of the fact that they can pull sediments out of the water column uh, because they can actually pull carbon out of the water column. Um, seagrass, uh, you may have, have uh, heard the, uh, the term blue ocean. Um, seagrass are being looked at as potential uh, offsets of carbon because they do such a good job of sequestering carbon and putting it in their uh, tissue. From a purely habitat standpoint, though, there I think it's I think the estimate is either 40 or over 40 or 50 percent of commercially and recreationally important fish spend at least part of their lives in seagrass. So they're the nurseries uh, of some of our most important fish species that we rely on, uh, not only from a commercial standpoint but from a recreational standpoint as well. Obviously, the scallop there in the picture uh, wouldn't be there if it weren't for the seagrass beds that we have. Uh, out there, so it's a it's a very important resource uh, in and of itself, but it also happens to be a very good indicator of the overall health of the estuary. Thank you, and of course we know it's uh, it's an important food source for manatees as well. Yes, and the, absolutely. <clears throat> and the manatees are dying of starvation near the Indian River Lagoon, where the seagrass um, beds have been. Uh, uh, diminishing um, the, at a great rate, um, uh, but that uh, important habitat for commercial and recreational fish um, is uh, uh, is the other side of this economically, as well as on our uh, for our tourist um, industry. Uh, Commissioner Cohen, you're recognized. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. You know, it, it appears from just an overall look at the map that it gets worse as you get away from the open gulf and come more to the interior of the bay. I don't know if that is true um, to the south of us as well, but my question is really this. Um, so we have this information, it's pretty definitive that this is uh, a problem. What are we doing about it or what should we be doing about it? Right, and, and I think that's a really good question because uh, as we, we, you know, we generate the maps, but, you know, these maps are used by, uh, by the community at large to answer that specific question. So, uh, obviously, we're focusing on producing the 22 maps to see are we seeing a recovery, are we seeing a stabilization, are we seeing further decline. But in the meantime, uh, the shift is focusing from the monitoring of the grass to uh, implementing uh, action to try and uh, improve the situation. And so that's, that's largely being done uh, both at an at a, a estuary level, so we're working very closely with the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, um, and you know, we, the district, is in the process right now of updating our swim plan for Tampa Bay. So all this information is factoring into developing the, the plans to, to 
you know, figure out what we can do about it. But we do that collectively, and, and not only just at, in Tampa Bay, but this conversation is happening at the regional level and actually at the state level. So, um, you know, Indian River Lagoon was mentioned. Uh, the conversation has increased to include folks from St. John's River Water Management District, the Indian River Lagoon Program, even Biscayne Bay and, and uh, Miami-Dade County, because those folks can teach us a lot and, and hopefully will can give us guidance to prevent uh, something like what happened in Indian River Lagoon from happening on the west coast of Florida. So these, these are all active conversations. We had uh, in April of this year, the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program hosted a macroalgae workshop. It was about a week long, and we brought in folks from all the estuary programs on the west coast, uh, Indian River Lagoon, Skane Bay, uh, federal partners like the U.S. Geological Survey, and uh, it was a very good workshop to discuss not only the status of what's going on with this sh apparent shift from uh, seagrass to algae, but also what can be done about it. So that was the sort of the first uh, major workshop. Now there's another one scheduled for October where, where and this is, this is really more for Sarasota Bay, but the other, again, you know, we're, we're all looking at this from a regional perspective. We'll be participating in this workshop and it's really to look at what local governments are doing in order to help uh, control and in order to help manage nutrient loads. Um, and then what, what can be done in the future. So, so there's a lot of work that's being done right now to address this. Well, you know, I, I think we all know that under the leadership of our, of our chair, we are uh, working toward passing a fertilizer ordinance to, to ban some of the, the runoff during the rainy season. But beyond that, we really need more of an action plan on this item. It, it really reminds me of the climate change debate that's going on throughout the world. We, we see the signs of it and we're just not acting fast enough in the wake of evidence that things are, are getting bad. And, and you know, you, you talked about, you used the term canary in the coal mine. Shame on us if we don't pay attention mm -hmm. to these signs and do something about it before the damage is irreversible. And, um, you know, I hope that, that in coming months, as we see this data develop, we can also be um, educated and perhaps help to find some mitigation strategies and other things that we can do to, um, to, to keep our water clean so that the seagrasses will bounce back. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I couldn't agree more with um, the urgency and the need to be uh, uh, get in front of things we see coming so that we don't, before we, our bay waters and seagrass beds reach the state of the Indian River Lagoon, we get in, do what we can to get in front of that. Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. And thank you. Uh, I was pretty much going to uh, ask the same thing. In fact, when I saw Commissioner Cohen's hand up first, I thought that they, it would probably be covered there. Um, but it, it just um, thank you for the presentation. And I know this is a evolving issue. And uh, you know, I've just heard for years how proud we were here in Hillsborough County and in the Tampa Bay area for our restoring our seagrasses and for it growing. And it's always been a great news story in terms of like improving something that was a terrible situation, I guess, for some decades and restoring it. So it's disturbing and um, concerning to hear this now. I just um, wondered in terms of the points where it was um, particularly heavy. It could that be? Is there just preliminarily any um, evidence or any thoughts that might be out there in terms of those are discharge areas or feeding or anything like that? I'm just curious. Yeah, there there's uh, a lot of conversation about you know potential causes. Uh, you know, I don't want to speculate at this point, but you know, one of the things there's two things really to that I take away from this. Number one is that, um, as someone had had pointed out, 
uh, the further up you go in Tampa Bay, uh, that's where you see most of the, you know, the loss. And that has to do somewhat with the circulation of the bay. Old Tampa Bay and Hillsborough Bay uh, have longer residence times than the middle and lower Tampa Bay, which tend to be more flushed because they're more proximal to the Gulf of Mexico. So stuff doesn't tend to sit in those lower uh, bay segments as much as it does in places like Old Tampa Bay and Hillsborough Bay. Uh, the other thing, too, to keep in mind is we've seen an increase in rainfall over the last decade, and um, you know that means that uh, the potential for increases in nutrient loading, um, the potential for increases in just turbid water or you know, organic material, uh, which which both also limit light, uh, has an impact as well. You know, some of the driest years we've had on record uh, occurred, you know, during a time when. You know, we saw increases in seagrass coverage. Um, when the rains started to increase, we started to see a bit of a, of a drop off. So there's there's probably some you know some uh, relationship between rainfall, circulation, and, and other things. But there's no one thing we can point to, unfortunately, as as is most is the case mostly in nature, where there's not one issue that we can go to and say that's that's the reason why we saw the, the decrease. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Commissioner Kemp. And, and following up on that, um, uh, it will be very interesting to see the next uh, seagrass mapping because this 16% loss occurred from 2018 to 2020, which is before the Piney Point disaster. Um, it's it's after or or includes the red tide of, of 2018, but um, you know very interesting to to see uh, in this presentation is the first time I've really understood that this loss is mainly caused by the uh, attached algae um, on or or at least there's certainly as our scientists might uh, put it a very strong correlation. Uh, between the attached algae and where we're where we're losing seagrass, where we lost seagrass, so um, is is that attached algae? Is that fed by nitrogen? Is that fed b by pollution? Can we can we connect the dot there, Mr. Anastasio? So that's yeah, that's a good observation, and, and so there's a couple of things to consider with respect to uh, attached algae. And again, this, in this case, uh, in the old Tampa Bay, we're talking about mainly chlorpha, which is that that attached algae. Uh, seagrass predominantly uh, get their nutrients from the sediment. Attached algae get their nutrients from the water column. So when you see a shift from seagrass to algae, that does indicate and I'm not saying it does in this case, but there is, again, that uh, <laughs> evidence to support that um, there is a, an increase in nutrients in the water column, but we don't necessarily see that in the water column because those nutrients are being taken up by the algae. So that's, a, that's something that we're talking about uh, at the Tampa Bay Estuary Programs. Uh, TAC, and specifically the Old Tampa Bay Working Group, is looking at those nitrogen pathways because nitrogen enters the bay and it goes into the macroalgae, which is growing on the bottom, but it's getting its nutrients from the water column. And then you come in and you take a sample from the water column. You may not actually see those nutrients because they're in the attached algae. Mm -hmm. And so those are things that we're looking at. We're looking much more carefully at the role that uh, these macroalgae and seagrass as well play uh, with the water column itself. It's, it's uh, you know, the Tampa Bay model, the paradigm has been very successful in Tampa Bay, has been you reduce nutrient loads into the bay, that reduces the chlorophyll concentration in the bay, largely driven by phytoplankton such as pyridinium that we talked about earlier. Uh, and that increases the clarity, which allows the grass to grow uh, at deeper depths. That paradigm has worked for years, and it's a good paradigm for Tampa Bay. Does not work everywhere, however. So there are other estuaries, like Charlotte Harbor, where that paradigm doesn't work. And it may be that in some segments of the bay, in this case, let's say well, Tampa Bay, the paradigm works, but it maybe needs to be refined a bit, because as we see those calerpa beds increase, 
Uh, that's telling us that they're pulling nutrients from the water column. So we can't forget what's happening in the benthic community and only focus on the water column. And these are things that we are discussing at the technical level right now. Thank you very much. And um, I see no other uh, uh, questions or comments by our commissioners, but I'll just wrap up with, um, I very much appreciate, I know we all do, your uh, your accessibility uh, and willingness to leave us with your phone number and your email um, and, and offering to take uh, further uh, questions um, after this. And I, I want to uh, assure you that that uh, communication goes both ways. You have here a board of uh, environmental protection commissioners and county commissioners who are uh, 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 very committed to um, uh, uh, to the health of Tampa Bay and our all our wetland systems and our, our wildlife systems, so ecosystems in general. So if you see or think of anything that uh, we can uh, be doing uh, to uh, in that regard to, to be more effective, um, the phone works uh, both directions and feel free to give uh, me a call and, and I see a lot of head nodding here. Uh, uh, in, in that regard as well. So I, I pass that along not only to you, Mr. Anastasio, but any of the other scientists who are uh, involved in the Agency on Bay Management, Swift Mud, and our EPC, that um, it, it, we are very open to any of your um, ideas and suggestions for, for ways we can be effective in uh, protecting uh, the health of our, our, our bay. And, and Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I appreciate that, and and believe me, uh, you know we recognize the contribution that that the EPC provides to monitoring the overall health of the bay. Uh, again, you know you all are, are are one of our many partners, and and with your efforts, you make a better you 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 enable us to produce a better seagrass map. So we thank you for that as well. I do look forward to coming back and sharing the uh, 22. Uh, numbers, hopefully, better news. Thank you very much. And um, Ms. Doherty, any uh, closing comments on, on these presentations and, and then your own uh, executive director's report? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And I think that letter, Commissioner Cohen, will be very timely for the flushing of Old Tampa Bay. And I do want to thank uh, Dr. Anastasio, uh, Sam L. Robbie and all of his staff. What great presentations. We've got a lot of information in a short period of time, and uh, we'll be bringing you back more information on this item as well. But thank you, Dr. Anastasio. Great presentation as well. And with that, Commissioner, I'll just move to my mm -hmm. executive director report. I just have a couple of quick slides. Um, if Mr. Brewer uh, or HTV could pull up my slides very quickly. Awesome. We can move to the next slide. Um, tomorrow, as the Hillsborough County is hosting their local legislative delegation at 9.30, uh, I look forward to being part of the online discussion and appreciate the opportunity to share information about our local environmental concerns. Rick Marotti and myself meet annually with legislators one-on-one -on -one in order to bring awareness to recent and upcoming environmental issues, which we've had a lot in the paper this year and to inform them of the programs and services we provide at EPC along with our contact information. Next slide, please. Uh, EPC's senior leadership team uh, will be meeting uh, tomorrow as well for our fall strategic planning. This meeting follows our initial session that was held this summer. We take this time to evaluate EPC's overall progress for the current year and discuss actions we will take in the upcoming year to meet our long-term goals. We also use this time to ensure that agency actions are aligned appropriately to achieve desired annual outcomes. Next slide, please. One of the initiatives that was developed as a result of our strategic planning sessions last year was the Know Your Agency Action Plan, which staff have been participating in since last October. The Wetlands Division is next to be featured in this quarterly training series. EPC believes it's important that all staff, whether administrative or out in the field, understand the functions and responsibility of each division and department in order to better serve the citizens of Hillsborough County. This training has been well attended by agency staff and the committee overseeing this action plan has received positive feedback. 
on the effectiveness of the various division training sessions so far. I'd like to thank Ron Pope and all the staff involved in coordinating this training effort. Next slide, please. Commissioners, I'm pleased to announce that I will be bringing you the EPC annual report during the next EPC meeting in October. This year's theme is the environment of champions, a theme you have seen us promote throughout the year with the Clean Air Month activities and outreach. We feel it is fitting to continue this theme and to highlight the efforts of our EPC staff who work hard to champion our environment and demonstrate good stewardship year round. Next slide, please. And with that, commissioners, our next meeting is October 21st. And um, I'm here for any questions, but that concludes my remarks. Thank you so much. I see no uh, comments or questions. So thank you very much for that report. And um, is there any discussion of future items uh, by any of the commissioners? I, we had plenty of that during the meeting. Uh, so seeing no, nothing further, we'll adjourn the meeting. And thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, everyone. Go Bucks.